today I want to start with proofs of the hard left shed theorems. Um, just because we had a little discussion before, let me repeat both statements next to each other because it's maybe useful. So, um, hard left sheds and company. Um, and this will be the classical case today. Um, so, um, let me say it first, uh, let me repeat first the, the version um, that is kind of classical or semi-classical. Uh, this is, goes back to McMullen. Um, the paper is on simple polytops. Although the language we stated in and we prove it in um, um, follows a paper by Fleming and Caro. from 2009. Um, and this is, we have sigma, the boundary of P, a d polytop, simplicial d polytop. Um, and then maybe I can actually use both in a parallel way. And L in A1 of sigma convex All right, so my ever uh, remember that somehow this, this geometry, it immediately, uh, it, it, it immediately implies that we have some linear system of parameters associated to the embedding of P into Rd. Um, and then we have the hard left sheds. All right, so we have an isomorphism between degree k and degree d minus k this algebra induced by the multiplication with L to the D minus 2K. And we have Hodgman. And Hodgman um, was that um, given the quadratic form, Q, I think I wrote K first and L then, um, on AK times AK to AD, to R, um, given by multiplying these two elements and sending them to the degree of A times B times L to the D minus 2K. And this book. Some sign convention for the degree. Is it clear what the in top dimension? Okay, we can we can we can we can say the what what should be the sign convention? It's kind of implicit here, but so in degree zero, right? A somehow well, you take a zero. What should it be? Well, we want the Hodgman relations to be well. Every element in degree zero, which is a constant function, right, is just is primitive clearly because the and so the, 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 the convention is the power of the degree zero function should be, um, well, it should be positive. The, some other, sorry, the power of a convex function, of a strictly convex function, should be positive. And that is your, your sign convention. Right? And you know it in particular, it is non zero. This is part yeah. of the result. Yes. Uh, okay, so there's, of course, this fixes it. Although a priori it is not clear. Uh, yeah, okay, there is a small. Uh, okay, but I understand. Um, but is it true that since uh, 
So of course this is independent of the choice of the strictly convex one because you can connect any two strictly convex one by continuously by... Yes, yes, you're, you're jumping ahead, so you're spoilering again. Okay, this is something that we will do. Um, we, will, we will continuously move strictly... For, yes, but patience, okay? <laughs> Let me just state, yes. Let me never go to the cinema with you because you will spoil the movies. <laughs> um, so, um, okay, um, is definite of sine minus one to the k on p l a k, which is the kernel of a k to a d minus k plus one, so once further than the left shades map times L induced by the multiplication with d minus 2k plus one. Um, that is um, the classical version, and this is what we will prove, or so I will go over the, the, the main steps and the main ideas of the proof today. And let me just compare this um, um, just to repeat to, to the, to the non-classical version. So, sigma, um, okay, let me write on symmetrically A18 and A21 um, um, is it and I will again restrict to the sphere version. I will not go for now to the cycle version. Um, and actually, let me let me say with the sphere, sphere version. So, triangulated um, d minus one sphere, and again, triangulated sphere just means for me homology. So. K homology sphere. All right, so I'm not in imposing any homotopy restrictions here. Um, then there exists theta, um, and there exists L um, in A1 of sigma theta such that um, well we have our left sheds the statement is symmetric so I will not so this this statement is symmetric um, and the second part is we have what I call the whole Laman relations Um, which state that Q um, K L does not degenerate at any monomial ideal. any square of a monomial ideal. Mm. And here I should again, so I should really say, so it's, it's critical that we choose theta in a clever way. So when we get, finally get to, to, to this theorem, we will see that there are bad choices of theta. So you can choose this theta, this, uh, this system of linear forms, in such a way that there will be no left sheds, that there can be no left sheds element. There can be some, there is no L such that the left sheds theorem holds. Um, so in the classical, so to speak, case that McMullen and so on, yeah. is it the case that the so-called whole Laman relations also hold? No. Okay, good, good question. Thank you. Um, that's a, a very... Uh, Astute spoiler, but let me let me go there. Uh, let's go to P1 cross P1. Okay. P1 cross P1. 
Um, what is the Simplicial complex or the Simplicial fan associated to it? Well, it's just, uh, well, it's a fan over the cross polytope, right? It's a normal fan to the unit Q, unit square. It's, um, it's also, the, in dimension two, it's also, the cross polytope is also a square, but uh, yes. All right, so this is a fan. All right. Um, let's look at the. Um, let, uh, let's look at um, Q one. Q one L. All right. Um, well, Q one L. Now, this 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 really. I mean, Q one L is just the pairing of the degree one with itself to degree two. Right, homogeneous degree two, homogeneous degree one. It's just, I mean, this is a pairing um, a one times a one to a two, and it just sends a times b to the degree of a times b. Oh, so a and b to the degree of a times b. So you want to say that this does not degenerate at um, um, at square free monomial ideals, and let's let's see. Well, we take can take the ideal generated by this divisor here. So this is v. All right. Um, okay. Um, what happens? So we have. I mean, so the ideal is just the ideal generated by chi v. So. In order for the parent not to degenerate, the only thing, the only chance that you have is a, for chi v to pair with, pair with itself. Ah, okay, and then of course it is zero. It is zero, of course. Um, okay, so there are several ways to see it. Um, which way did you see? No, no, it does correspond to O1, O1 projection of P1. Yes, so yes, yes. The telling of this is itself is zero. Yes, and that's yes. a rough geometric setup. Yes, and yes, yes. And here you are just translating it into combinatorics. But yes. it's so, the, so clearly, so this is from an algebraic geometry perspective. Um, here's another, just somehow the, the if if we want to stay in our pictures of convice poly, oh, convice polynomial functions, right? So, um, chi v is a restriction to this upper hemisphere, right? It is non-trivial linear here and zero here, but it also restricts to a global. It's also the restriction of a global linear function, right, to the upper hemisphere, right? Because Really, it is linear at this. It is linear at this at this uh, at this ray, right? It's zero here, one, zero. So it's linear. So it's a linear function, right? Restricted okay. to the upper hemisphere. And then you get the lawyer and you make the product is zero. Yes, that's it. Yeah, so it's, so this here curve is, but is is square free monomial ideal. Ideal, but. Chi v square uh, is zero. And that's it. So, how far do you see how to repair it? Well, I could de deform this fan, right? Um, I could maybe do this. And in this case, at least chi v squared will not be zero. All right, if I go to the Hertzberg surface here. Um, and similarly, well, I mean, I could, so the, the point where we, okay, so now you see that this is somehow, it has somehow to do with this, with, with the linearity here, and we will later see um, that more precisely, um, this, this, uh, this pairing property is true um, if the linear system Theta acts as left shed elements on certain sub varieties here. Okay, but this is something we will do not not today, but uh, next next time we meet. All right. So the, you see that even somehow it's kind of transversal. Even somehow very nice and smooth varieties don't satisfy this principle. Um, it's a somewhat strange principle. So I, I don't know whether I mean I, I haven't seen it. In algebraic geometry considered yet because maybe it's also not really, I mean, it's not about something about the fixed algebraic variety. It doesn't really make sense then. Um, all right. 
But today I want to prove um, um, the classical case. Um, so, which is for me, I mean, the semi-classical case, so it's not the classical proof of the hart of Schett theorem, but I want to do this classical combinatorial principle. All right. Mm. And for this, we will need um, a double induction. So we will have two sections um, that, um, well, you, you, you can imagine going from going to the mountains for. So section one will be uh, the climb, and then section two will be, well, if you don't climb, you have some horizontal stretches. So this will be um, the hike. OK. So let me do the climb first. So what do we need? Well, we want to have a lemma that in some way implies, well, in an induction of dimension, in, in some conditions on, on, on polytopes of dimension d minus 1, from some sort of, uh, condition there, we want to conclude um, the left, uh, at least some, 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 something about left sheds or Hodge Riemann in, in dimension d. Um, and um, this is the lemma. It's, 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 a, I mean, it's, it's uh, surprisingly, it's surprising in its ingenuity. It's an amazing lemma. Um, um, so we consider sigma um, the boundary of P, um, the d polytope. Let me not say every time that it's simplicial because it wastes space. Simplicial is such a long word. Um, then we have L in A1 of sigma strictly convex. Um, and now we make an assumption. Assume that the Hodge-Riemann relations hold in co-dimension one. Um, holds in co-dimension one. Does it uh, include the tau that it holds, or you just want the? Yes, of course. I mean, of, I mean, Hodge-Riemann. What does I mean? Hodge-Riemann says that this form does not degenerate, which is stronger than saying that. I mean, it says some. It, it says. In particular, that this form does not degenerate, which in particular says uh, that uh, small. It doesn't degenerate on the primitive subspace. Yes, but then you have it for every primitive. You have it for for all the k, right? And then you have the left shell decomposition implicitly built in. Yeah, there is also the left shell decomposition uh, statement, which which follows from our left shell, but it can be stated uh, separately. Um. But if you just know all. Yeah, it depends what the formula. If you just know Hodge Riemann in terms of just you define the primitive by kernel of something, but of course, just we need the, we need to know. Um, okay, so let's just say. I mean, let's okay. So let's let's not. We have hard left sheds and Hodge Riemann. Fine. Okay, Hodge Riemann plus hard left sheds. Uh, I think yeah, you you you're right. You can state it in some way that it's independent. Let me let's just be on the safe side. In could I mention one? Right, so for, for d minus one polytopes. Um, then hard left shed is true. It's true for sigma. Okay. 
Mm. Proof. Um, well, let's assume the contrary. Assume there exists an alpha not equal to zero in a k of sigma such that l to the d minus 2k times alpha is equal to zero. Um, and now what we do is what we consider is um, the restriction to the star of array. So we have a star of a vertex uh, which corresponds to the star of array in the fan picture. Consider A restricted to the star of array corresponding to the vertex V. Alright, so this is a restriction to a star. All right? And this naturally, so let me make a picture. Alright, so this here would be the ray and this would be the star. Now I can naturally project this down. Alright. And get a fan of co-dimension one. This is again projective. It again has, um, it again has the restriction of the, strict, the restriction of L to this fan is again strictly convex. So this is naturally, if you think about it, this is naturally a structure for the link. All right. This is again the this is naturally the link. If you think of the link here in this complex, all right, the link. The link was all those faces that do not uh, form a face together uh, that that form to get face together with my with my array, um, but do not intersect it, except trivially. All right, and now I mean so this was supposed to be blue, and this is a projection. All right, so I will I will denote this because it's supposed to be a co-dimension one. I will denote this by a, the link of the vertex. Let's see. Now we need two facts. Um, one, alpha. Okay, so we had last time we had, when we discussed Poincare duality, we noted that being a Poincare duality algebra means just that it, I pull back to some star of a vertex non trivially. So, so the, the quality of this A requires some small proof. I mean, because there are di single different dimensions, you have to choose the theta um, correspondingly in some way. Yes. It, um, okay. If you want to. The geometry, you know, there is no choice of theta yeah. because it is given. Exactly. There is no choice of theta here. That's the point. Um, otherwise, yes, that is right. But later we will discuss this. Uh, this in more generality, and then we will explicitly see what this does to the theta. But here it is fine. So alpha, right, I, I can map alpha into the direct sum over the stars or the links of the vertices, it doesn't matter. Link of the vertices and sigma. All right. Um, what do I know? This is, it has, what do I know? Well, I know that this has non-zero image. All right, so um, this here is something not equal to zero. Because remember, this map from the degree k of sigma, this was an injection. All right, this was Poincare duality. All right, this, this map here. This is an injection. That's the first fact that we shall need. Um, and the second fact is just that
Well, so alpha, if I restrict it to the link, all right? So let me say alpha link v sigma. Well, what does it do? Well, I can also multiply it with the pullback of the left shed class. Let me just write restrict it to v, then I don't have to write link v every time. This will be zero. Corollary, a consequence or whatever, is that alpha v is in p lv ak of link v sigma. Yes, it's primitive. All right. Um, aye, aye, aye. Okay, so let me delete the classical, the, the not the, the non-classical version for now, just to finish my argument. You take the P L, P L degree, no P, uh, the index. Uh, there are two, two indices in. No, I thought which index is what? Well? P. Ah, this is just a restriction to V. So, it's a pullback to the link of V. Do you mean this, uh, the subscript here? Ah, yeah, this is L restricted to V, which means restricted to the link of V. Yeah, 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 yeah. I wanted to. I didn't want to write link V every time because, anyway, but to, to make you happy. Then okay, that's it. It's not uh, just V itself, it's too late. Yeah. You're right, sorry. Okay. And now let's compute let's compute well not quite the Hajima bilinear form, but let me compute minus one to the k times the Hajima bilinear form um, of alpha. Alpha, alpha. All right, which is just minus one to the k um, of L to the d minus two k to the d minus two k times alpha squared. Um, ah, well, I, so it is. Yeah, degree in sigma, and now minus one to the k. Yeah, okay. Degree in the in the in the small in the link. No, no, no. This is still the global one. This is still the global one. All right. So I'm still computing it globally. Ah, this is k. Okay. So maybe I should write. Okay. So this is the degree in sigma, and this is in sigma. All right. This is still now. I'm I'm still computing in sigma. Okay. In the, full. in the full sigma, yes. All right, and let me just come to a convention. So let me write, um, let me write um, L as a sum of Li xi, where the Li is positive. All right, it's convex. Um, Okay, so this is the sum of, okay, minus, minus one to the k times the sum of, and now I basically just, okay, so now I, I, I take one of, the, one, of the, one of the L's, right, and split up. So I take degree um, in sigma still of Li xi, and then I compute, well, I compute alpha squared times L to the D minus 2K minus 1. All right, and I can pull this out, minus 1 to the K again. Um, and then I, okay, so now I, I, okay, so the Li is a scalar, doesn't matter. Xi is a pullback to the vertex. So this is degree now in the link of the vertex of sigma. 
of, okay, so what do I have left? Well, I have just in the, I have um, alpha squared L to the, ah, oh, again, I, yeah, so now I have to restrict to V, L, V, D minus 2K minus 1. Uh, 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 it's not number, it's element of one dimension. What do we mean? X, I multiply by degree. I. Oh, um, no, sorry, sorry. Now I, I pulled back. Sorry, that's right. I pulled back. Yeah. No, but you, you need some uh, information. You said that you have to choose an orientation on the top, which is, you said before that you do it using the top power of L. You said you have to prove it's non zero. So there is something cyclic in mean, this equation. Okay, but I mean, if, if you think about it, if I, if I look at it in degree zero, I really only induct on degree zero all the time. So it's not, there's no cyclic logic here. Right? You are looking at um, the degree zero function. Um, yeah, you are looking at the degree zero function, uh, the, 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 the unique element in degree zero, and you can pull it, you can pull the whole argument through in degree zero, or you can define the degree directly. Or you can actually, you can actually verify directly that there, exists a, that there exists a strictly convex function whose power is non-negative. So let's... Precise the qualities of degree and not up to some scalar, which is also surprising, I mean, because the degree was just a choice of the uh, of the top dimension. I mean, it's you didn't normalize the degree enough to write this equality. Okay, yeah, I'm 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 I'm, I'm, I'm cheating a little here, but I'm just giving you the idea of this classical proof. Okay, um, that's right. I mean, uh, there is a little more to discuss, and there is also a little more to discuss with respect to this projection isomorphism. But uh, let me just give you the idea. Um, because what happens now, right? So this is of sine minus one to the k. If well, what's happened? Well, under which condition? If alpha restricted to the link of v is not zero, because it's primitive, right? Because it was primitive here. But then this sum, okay, so we know that one of these alpha v must be non-trivial because of this injection here, yeah. all right? Um, in particular, this whole thing, all right? Okay, so now I, minus one to the k, minus one to the k, so this must be strictly larger than zero, all right? And that's it. Because no, the way you look at zero, five vectors minus one for k, just say it's all has the same sign. Yes, 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 yeah, yeah, okay, fine, I wanted to make it more, yeah. You're right, but fine. Um, all right, so um, that is the, 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 the vertical induction. Um, but you don't have HR as a quality, yeah? Yeah, we don't have HR. We don't have the Hodge relations, that's right. Um, so now we prove the Hodge relations, all right? Mm. All right, let me find something to. All right, let me delete this part. So now we go horizontally. We have the hard left sheds for deep polytops. Hard left sheds. For deep polytops. 
want hot dream on. Not human resources, hot dream on. Um, all right. So how do we do this? Okay, so, all right, so we have sigma, and this is the boundary of some polytop P. We have no clue how to get the Hodge Riemann there. So what do you do first? If you don't have no clue, you do an example. So here's sigma. Um, let me actually see that I do a good notation. Let me, let me do sigma tilde, uh, which is the boundary um, of the D simplex. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, what is the algebra A sigma tilde? Or maybe actually I want to, let me call it Sigma zero, anticipating it a little. Sigma zero. Um, well, I mean, the variety is just, all right, it's just projective space. So the ring here is just, I take the polynomial ring in one variable. So this is really just one variable this time. Right? And then I truncate it in degree d plus 1. Okay? That's it. Um, so the only, I mean, the only non trivial primitive um, classes live in degree 0. Right? And okay, so now. Um, okay, so there's only really only, I mean, there's really only one, there's only one, one L in A1, all right? It's automatically convex if we, I mean, if we do choose a sign right, and then, well, we just multiply it um, to the dth power, compute the sign, or make the sign convention in this case, and then we're done. That's good. So this case is fine. So, but this is, a, okay, this is sigma zero. We want to go to sigma one, right? Um, how do we get there? It's not the smartest use of space today. Um, well, we want to stay within the realm of convex polytopes. We want to go from the polytope that we understand to a different polytope that we may not understand. And what we do now is we deform this polytope into this polytope in a continuous fashion by doing the following. I introduce new vertices. All right, so I have some, I have some mystery locations that I want my new vertices to be in. So draw them, let me draw them here. All right, so these are the vertices that I want to have in the end. These are the vertices I have at the start. So I introduce a new vertex in the interior. All right, and then I continuously move it in general position to the vertex coordinate that I want. Okay? Um, at, 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 at each stage, I take the convex hull. This gives me a family of polytopes going from P0 to P1. Okay, so family, so one parameter family PT, um, connect, family of polytopes. Of polytopes. Connecting P0 and P1. All right, I take the convex hull at each, at each stage. Now, um, if I do this in general position, 
at almost every point in time, right, except at a finite number of points in time, this will be a simplicial convex polytope, right? At almost every point in time, almost at every point in time, Um, this is simplicial, all right? Now, notice that when I move from one simplicial location in this family to another simplicial location, all right? So let's say in the time interval from, from T to, from, from, from TA to TB, all right, in this interval, P does not, P stays simplicial, right? Then the combinatorics of the fan does not change. Hard left shed does not change. Hard left shed is true, right? By induction, right? So, so P in PT simplicial in interval. And also the geometry doesn't change if you don't the number. The geometry changes, right? The geometry of, of, the, of the whole thing changes. The theta changes with the polytope, geometrically. No, you know, but I'm saying that uh, it, you have a convex or of some number of vertices, and the number of vertices you see... Yeah, the, the, the combinatorics does not change, yes. The combinator no, but it's some... When the combinatorics changes, so like when this point goes out of the... Yeah. Uh, is it in the boundary, in the limiting point, is it the case that the... You, you don't have a simplicial... Uh... Yeah, in general, I don't want to... I mean, okay, dimension two, you only see simplicial. Yeah, okay. So but in the higher dimensions, we will see it, yes. Yeah. But you have to say, it's rather that it is simplicial and there is no change in the combinatorics. I mean... There will be change in the combinatorics, but first, of, first I want to say what happens if there's no change in the combinatorics. Yeah, then, then, then you can go from one to another by easy algorithm. Yes, yes, because now we know that the hard left shed is true, right? Therefore, the Hodgkin by linear form does not degenerate, therefore the signature stays the same yeah. in this continuous motion. Yes. Yeah? Okay. That's just it. So, so just let me just say again, because not everyone might have already figured out as fast as offer. So in this interval, hard left sheds remains true. Hard left sheds is true. Um, hence, Hodgman is preserved. Okay. So we have to discuss what happens in the situations, right? When, hard, when, uh, when there's a transition in the combinatorics, right? This is what we have to discuss. Okay. Mm. Now, what happens in these cases where, um, where the combinatorics changes? Um. <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. That's what is happening now. Um. So the points are still moved in general position. So when when there's a transition in combinatorics, then there are d plus one points, instead of the normal d points, d um, being the simplex, inside the boundary hyperplane, all right? So um, think about it like this. So if I have, if I have uh, the, uh, these two triangles, I, I'm looking at the three-dimensional polytope, right? To so make it more interesting, all right? At some point, they become flat, and then they go into the other direction. So what I... Encountering is d plus one points in a boundary hyperplane, a supporting hyperplane. 
hyperplane. Uh, at um, um, yeah, at some point, at some point in time, t zero. At some point in time, t zero. And let me just make an example of what this looks like. So, in a three-dimensional polytope, so d equals three. I would have four points in one hyperplane, a two-dimensional subspace, right? And before the transition, it might look like this, right? So it's bent in this way, right? So about this here, and this, the hyperplane is bent by this, that's higher than this one. And then after the transition, it looks like, like this. Right, the outer points, um, the outer points, they, they are entrenched, but somehow the the transition lies inside, inside this quadrangle, inside this d plus one poly, this uh, this d polytope on d plus one vertices. Sorry, this sorry, this d minus one polytope on d plus one vertices. Right, so this is a transition. This is called the Pachner move. Right, Pachner. Move. No, but I want, I'm a little bit uh, mm -hmm. concerned because you start from a point in the interior of no, the point. Yeah, I, okay, okay. So There's another partner move. There's another one that can happen in dimension three. Yeah? This is one of them. The other one in dimension three is, right, the vertex moves out through the. Yes, interior. okay, this is the, the one I have in mind. This is another one. Okay. Right. Yes. Okay, and these are the two, the two moves um, in dimension one. In dimension three, um, in dimension two, there's just this one move, um, and in general, you have roughly d half. All right. So we have to understand what this does. There are several ways to do it. I will, I will go over, over one. I mean, one way would be to, see, to notice that these are somehow that there is a common refinement here, right? That is coming from a blow up, right? I could blow up this point. There's a common refinement here, right? And then I can construct a map between this and this. I will now follow, I will basically follow the paper by, by Fleming and Carew. Um, actually, the reference I deleted um, to um, to construct a map between um, one part and the other, right? Before the flip and after the flip. And for this, let me come to the following convention, right? So, in total, there are d plus one vertices here, um, and let me call the one. So, let's say this 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 part here has m vertices, and this part here has d plus 1 minus m vertices, all right? They add up, and I will make the assumption that m is less or equal to, um, well, I want to, to have exactly, um, whoop, don't die. Um, I want to have, um, want to be um, below the threshold, so d plus m should be less or equal to d plus one half, and my notation will be um, that this here will be sigma plus, and this here will be sigma minus. All right, so the flip that introduces um, the lower dimensional phase Right, uh, the, the, the lower cardinality phase, this will be by just by convention sigma plus, the other one will be sigma minus, just for notation. So in this case here, again, this here would be sigma plus, and this here would be sigma minus. Because I want to construct a map from sigma minus to sigma plus. All right? Um, yeah, that's it. That's that's just what it, what would be happening. 
Um, all right, um, and now we want to construct the map. And actually, um, a map on the algebra, so on the yeah, it will not be a, um, it will not be a map of of, of algebras. So it will not uh, unless uh, unless you're in this case where it's a refinement. It will not be a map of algebras. It will be a map of graded vector spaces that behaves nicely with respect to the left shed element and taught you about linear form. But otherwise, no. Okay. Um, all right, so I think that's this is a good time. This is a good time to take maybe 10 minutes. What do you want? Maybe 10 minutes. So again, let me actually make the non-symmetric situation even though it's a little boring. Um, um, so M, the cardinality of the minimal simplex induced, of uh, minimal simplex introduced, simplex introduced, introduced, um, Um, sigma oh, m less or equal to d half one half um, sigma plus um, after the flip um, delta uh, plus will be the flip locus So just this after the flip, all right? So just the, where the, the combinatorics changes, the d plus one vertices involved um, and the simplex on them. Um, sigma minus analogously before the flip, delta minus um, before the flip, and then gamma, will be um, sigma plus um, um, without the flip locus, right? So the, 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 the complex on the remaining facets. Um, and this is, of course, the same as sigma minus without the corresponding flip locus here. Oh, oh by the way, it doesn't it respond to people. Variational geometry. Yes, 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 yes. Um, yes. Variational geometry. Yes. Mm. Um, and let's understand some maps. Um, so let me introduce for a second, and we will also need it later. So now delta, delta plus the flip locus. Is it a part of the? Complex or? Yes, it's subcomplex. Sub it's exactly the star of the minimal phase that was introduced. Okay. All right. Yeah. So it is a subcomplex, and when you take minus. Okay, this is okay. So again, it means that you take the. These are all the. This is the simplicial complex on all the facets that are not part of the flip locus. All right. I take the down closure of all the facets. So. Ah, okay. You take all those guys which are not in the flip locus, yeah. and then of course if, but you since you need to take the boundaries and so on, so you have to add the stuff that is. Yeah, yeah. I take the closure. I take the simplicial closure. Yes. That's right. Okay, the closure. Yes, geometrically, it's the closure of the difference which is triangulated. Yeah. Um. And it is a simplicial complex on a set of vertices that could be smaller. Oh, no. Yes, it could be small, yes. Okay. Right, I mean, there's one less vertex here, in this case. Right, this vertex does not appear outside. But in most cases, it's the same ver yes. set of vertices. Yes. I mean, in most cases, I mean, the, you introduce a minimal phase of cardinality M. Right, and the minimal phase, that is where the combinatorial difference starts. And now also the algebraic difference, of course. Right? Um, let me just briefly introduce relative objects, okay? So if I have 
two simplicial ferns, one contained in the other, all right, all right, so A, so B sub fern of A, of A, then uh, the space of, this, this here will denote the space of Cohn-Weiss polynomials on A that vanish on B. Similarly, I could do the face ring picture and say, if I have two simplicial complexes containing each other, all right, then, all right, so you remember that um, the face ring of a simplicial complex, this was defined as a polynomial ring um, modulo the non-phase ideal of A. And now uh, what I do is I take the non-phase ideal of B, of the smaller thing, all right, I'm vanishing there, um, modulo the non-phase ideal of A. All right? And then... So to be non uniform Well, I mean, this, 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 I mean, you can think of it as a module of a... Huh? This is a non-phase ideal of B divided by the non-phase ideal of A. Remember, I saw the non-phase ideal of a simplicial complex, I delta, right? This was um, the ideal generated by those x to the alpha, such so that the support of alpha was not part of the simplicial complex. Right, and you can think of this as a, as a Ka module. Oh, so uh, inside which ring? Inside, okay, so we fix uh, the number of vertices of the bigger complex, right? That's our, our polynomial ring, right? Uh, in some polynomial ring. Yeah. So we take the number of vertices of the, the vertices of the bigger complex. As a polynomial ring, yes. then you have the non phase ideal, and for the smaller complex, you take the monomials which are non faces, but including those which contain values. Yeah, yeah, exactly. These are somehow, these are non faces, exactly. Yes. Yes, thanks. Yes. Okay. So these are somehow, these are not vertices of B. Therefore, I take them in the non phase ideal. Yes. That's a natural way to do it. Yes. Thanks. And here, somehow, here it's more natural, right? It's just. You have a big fan, we have a space of Cohn-Weiss polynomials, you just declare those, you look at those that vanish on, 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 on the subcomplex, right, on the subfan. On the subfan. So A, B is a subfan of, an, of a fan A. Yes. You have the Cohn-Weiss polynomials on A, and you look at those that vanish on B. All right? Ah, okay. I, I'm just giving you, once again, I gave you two ways of thinking of this ring. Now I give you two, th two ways of thinking about the relative object. Okay. okay. Um, and now I want to write down um, some short exact sequences. Um, oops. So what I could write down is, for instance, I can look at the short exact sequence. Um, a delta plus minus, boundary delta plus minus. Here just plus minus just means it works for the pluses and for the minuses, right? So um, a sigma plus minus to a gamma to zero. Um, why is this a short exact sequence? Well, one way to do it would be um, well, we could we could look, we could we could use the fact that we are shellable, and then you can prove exactness along a shelling, or you can use the fact that gamma is again a homology disk, right? Prove this before the Athenian reduction, which is trivial, and then you prove this. Then you then you take out the linear system, which are Zul complex thing in built inside when you verify because you do it first before quotient thing, and then you apply the Kozul complex yes. information that. There is only H zero, or so or yeah. Exactly. And the number of elements in the Kuzul complex is the same for all three. Yes. Yes. Okay. Because of the dimension. Okay. Right. So all, they are all of the same dimension. That's right. Okay. 
And then I also have the um, reverse exact sequence. So now I take gamma as a relative object. Plus minus two a delta plus minus. All right. Um, all right. Um, let's look at um, the top map. Let me. I think blue is not so. Visible, let me go, go with red. Let's look at this map here. Um, right, my goal is, let me write it on the other side of the blackboard. My goal is to construct a map from A sigma minus to, to A sigma plus. And in fact, I want to construct an embedding. Um, again, as graded vector spaces, first of all. Um, all right. So this is exact. Um, and now the question is, um, where does this where where does where does this here become non-trivial? Well, it becomes non-trivial um, in the case of sigma plus. Right, what is the minimal generator here? Well, it's a minimal face, right? It's a minimal interior face. So the generator, uh, generator for um, A delta plus, boundary delta plus, is in degree, is in homogeneous degree um, M. In the case of delta minus, this is in degree, in homogeneous degree, uh, d plus 1 minus m. By my assumption that m was less or equal to d half, either way, I have an isomorphism, right? I have an isomorphism from, um, from a, um, a sigma minus to a gamma and from a sigma plus to a gamma um, for um, homogeneous, so for, for k, for degree k, for, for k um, less than m. Okay, that's an isomorphism. What happens for the other degrees? Well, um, let me use green. So for degree at least m, I want to look at this map. And what do I get? Well, so now, okay, so I always have an injection, all right? Um, so I have A um, gamma, boundary of gamma is always an injection. All right, so let me let me write it write it on both sides. So I have my map to a sigma plus, and I have my map to a sigma minus. Was there some sound? Okay. Um, okay. So for a sigma minus. Um, okay, so in A sigma minus, um, I have to look at the closed star of delta 
minus, right? The closed, so small, delta minus, I have to look at. So now I have to look at what are, what, what are the non-trivial en entries in delta minus? Well, it turns out, okay, so um, I clearly have a non-trivial component in degree zero, and in degree, and in degree, okay, so degree zero comes from the constant. Then I have, um, okay, so if I have, um, if m is strictly larger than one, then I have another entry. But if I think about it, really, this is, this is really just projective space again, right? So and it goes up to, well, it goes up to the cardinality of the simplex. So what I have is that this here is isomorphism for k larger or equal to m. Um, in the other case, I only have an injection. Which together, right now I have covered all degrees, gives me my desired injection. So it is an isomorphism for k b is equal to m because because delta minus vanishes above degrees uh, above these degrees. Okay. Delta minus here. Okay, so this here is a right. I'm looking now at this cross exact sequence to construct this map. Okay, so I'm saying that delta minus, right, this here vanishes from degree m on. Ah, this is universal since we're stuck in one. Yeah, yeah. Because delta minus is the flip locus. Yes, it's a flip locus before the flip, right? Yes. I always, by convention, my flip introduces a lower dimensional, the, the lower dimensional phase. Okay? So let us say in this example. Yes. Uh, this is so. This is just the. Yes. So what is what is delta minus? What is a of delta minus? In this object here. Well, this is just the const. This is just the reals. Right. It's just the simplex. Ah. Okay. It is. Uh Okay, it's not the projective variety. Yeah, 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 it's not the projective variety, right? This is a cone, right? This is a cone in a, a simplicial fan, right? It's a yeah, it's one simplicial cone. It's just the affine part. Yeah. Is it case m equal to d plus one called flop? Yeah. Uh, yes, I don't know. Uh, Does it have to do with flip flop in as a variety? So, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. It is, but and. I think there are some people calling one direction flop and one direction flip. I don't, uh, that, I, that part I don't remember, it might be. Uh, some people call one direction flop. I call both directions flips. You, 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 I mean, you, kind of, you have a situation where you blow up a smooth subvariety and then you can blow down and get something else. So yeah, it's exactly the square. You can find it on another day. But it's exactly the square. square. Yeah. It's clear again. All right, I actually wanted to go a little further today. Um, so now, um, if you think about it a little more, then we can actually describe the co-kernel here rather explicitly. So if you think about it, the co-kernel comes exactly from here, right? The co-kernel of this inclusion comes exactly from here, but it is truncated in degree n minus m. So what I have is Um, that um, finally I have this injection, and finally I have that a sigma plus I can write as a sigma minus plus, now I take a delta, or delta plus, boundary delta plus, but I truncate it in degree um, d minus m. So, truncate it after, let me be specific, I truncate everything after degree d, d minus m, after uh, d minus m. So, I, 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 all right, so this is, if you think about it, it's just a polynomial ring in one variable um, up to degree d, I truncate it already in de degree d 
minus m. All right. And this is a nice decomposition. Um, I claim that this decomposition is orthogonal. Is orthogonal under the Poincare pairing. Under the Poincare pairing. And for this, let um, let me call this here. All right. So let me call this here. Okay. So let's let's consider beta in. Um, uh, beta in beta in k um, of degree lowercase k larger or equal to m. All right, and then let's look at alpha in um, well a sigma minus of degree. Well, what is it? What is the degree? It's d minus k, um, right? And since k is at uh, least um, m, right? So this here is most d minus m. Um, and now what I do is okay. So in this degree, I can look at well, I can look at once again at this. Um, part of the exact sequence, this part vanishes in the, uh, sigma minus. Therefore, this part is an isomorphism, right? So this is something that we already had discussed before. So um, therefore, alpha is in the image of the inclusion of gamma, boundary gamma, and d minus k. To um, a sigma minus d minus k, because in these degrees I'm an isomorphism, right? All right. So this is an isomorphism in um, degree d minus k. Therefore, I'm taking alpha, which vanishes, right? So now this is an element um, alpha. Um, in sigma minus, that vanish, that is non-trivial, just in gamma, right? Which is the component, right? So gamma was the component outside of the plic locus. Here it is non-trivial; it vanishes here. It is, and I multiply it with something in beta, which is non-trivial in the flip locus and vanishes on the boundary. Therefore, the product is zero. Product is zero. All right. Um, that is it. Um, so this is Poincaré pairing. Now, if I'm orthogonal Poincaré pairing, I will also be automatically um, orthogonal under the Hojima pairing. So I really only have to say something about the signature on, well, on the generator of this co-kernel, right? The, the primitive part. All right, the primitive part will come purely from here. There will be one generator in the, for the primitive part, so beta generator, let me call it just beta again, or maybe beta bar generator for a delta plus, um, boundary delta plus. All right. And I, want, I just have to compute the signature of, of, of the Hojima bilinear form on beta. On beta bar, right? this will be in degree m, right? Degree m, and specifically, this is the characteristic function of the minimal phase that I introduced, right? So, in this case, it would be the characteristic function of this ray. So, beta. You know that the pairing, the, the kind of the pairing using the Hojeman thing for a sigma minus viewed inside a sigma plus is the same as 
you have to compare the pairing. Not only this is orthogonal, but you have to compare the pairing. Yes, okay, so now I'm looking at this at time, at this, at this transition time, right? When I have both fans together, right? And then I have uh, the, the linear function now will be, the, 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 the function L will be linear on these d plus one vertices. And now if you think about it, this implies the compatibility, okay? The fundamental classes coincided. Yes, exactly. The fundamental classes coincided, that was. That's the point, yes. Um, I wanted to, yeah. Let me, okay, so let me try to give the rest of the intuition. So beta, um, beta bar, I should, yeah, it's another, I shouldn't rush, uh, then it gets, it gets chaotic, but let me try to give the, give the rest of the int intuition. So now I have to say why does the right, why do I have the right sign? All right, so beta bar is the characteristic function of the minimal phase introduced, introduced, okay, um, which is the characteristic function again is the product of the minimal of the characteristic function of the vertices of the minimal phase introduced. Um, okay. So now, okay, so now we look at the characteristic function of this vertex here, right, in this case. And we notice that on this flip locus, it's a concave function. Right? On this, it is zero outside, it is one here, it's exactly concave. Right? Um, if I have another flip locus, like this, right, each of these vertices, the characteristic function of this vertex will be concave on this region. And then I multiply with this characteristic function, right, uh, KW, KW, which is all again concave. So every time I, I multiply with a characteristic function here of a vertex, that will be con the multiply with a concave function. Okay, so in the end, I have a concave function to the m, and then times a left-shed element. So the sign that I get is exactly minus one to the m for the, for the product of the concave functions, and then um, I get my left-shed element. Therefore, the sign is minus 1 to the m. Yeah, but it's just calculation, some concrete situation, your model situation. Yeah. It's, 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 yeah. It's universal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, some other, it's a concave function, concave linear um, to the m times the left shed element, times the l to the. Um, well, times the left-shed element, the d minus 2, um, and um, d minus 2m. Yeah, that's it. Um, and this gives me the sign. This gives me the sign minus 1 to the sign minus 1 to the yeah, So this is simply here like positive current asymptotic yeah. Yes, yes, that's another way, yes. All right, and this is a proof, right? So, Basically, I, um, I flip, I control what happens to the signature at the flip, and every other time my signature is preserved, therefore I end up with a desired Hodgema relations by a continuous deformation. Oh, but uh, is it analog? Suppose we don't know algebraic you know, geometry, this is Hodgema relation, but we, we do flips in uh, of flops in version geometry and between two projective varieties. Then we can go from one to another. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so we can. Yes. Okay. So yeah. If you don't have a priori, this Hodgson Yes. There is also yes. Exactly. So there's this. There's a write down of of of, of proving some in the classical algebraic geometry language. Um, the hard left sheds on Hodgson in this way. This is uh, the paper by Cata de Cataldo Migorini that I mentioned, that does this this way. Um, 
Um, but now I followed basically just the convex geometry version. All right. Um, now I wanted to say a little about. Um, so the, what do they do? Uh, do they treat? Uh, well, I know there are several papers actually uh, for some time. Yeah. I not. I did not. Uh, I know there was a group of Kipa, but I don't remember now what. They prove, uh, they reprove, I mean, I know that they reprove the composition theorem in some yeah. way for, for the usual case of complex, uh, but uh, for hard lapses, do they do, do they? Um, they? They do essentially something very similar to this. But for which varieties? For um, I don't quite remember the generality. Let's look later. Um, you know, it also leads away from what I want to do, actually, so. Okay, okay. Um, Let's, let's discuss later, yeah. Thanks. All right, um, so I wanted to at least um, give the intuition for one case that is where we go now beyond classical varieties, really, somehow this year, I mean, okay, it's close enough, right? It's, it's okay, it's, a, it's over the reals, but still um, it's a complete fan, so you can kind of imagine that it is true. So I wanted to at least do one, actually I wanted to do two cases, but let me just to restrict to one, and this is the case of matroids. Um, if you want, I will talk about um, the other case over coffee. So the Elias Williamson work. All right. Okay. Mm. So three point three beyond beyond polytops, but still convex. So this is. We will not even have, so we will not have, we will discuss fans now that are not complete. So um, that is that is point. I mean, there's, you're right, about there is another way of talking about not simple polytops, um, but then we have to go and introduce some combinatorial version of intersection cohomology. I won't, uh, I won't go into it. Again, this is something we can discuss more in private. So a matroid, for me, um, is um, uh, a combination of a ground set E finite. And let me just come to the convention that it's just numbers from zero to some number n. Um, Um, for now, and L is a subset of the power set such that um, well, I want the empty set and the ground set to be in L. Um, I want, in addition, that if I have two elements in my lattice, um, then the intersection should be and I want a so-called covering action. So if I have an S in L and I look at the set CS of sets of T without S, where T is an L um, and T covers S in L, um, that this partitions um, the complement of S and E. Hmm? Uh, 
One T to be strictly bigger than S. Strictly bigger, and there should be no two, uh, no element in between them in the order. Okay, so these are ordered by inclusion. Okay, L ordered by inclusion. And this you want to is a partition. Partition. Is it something usual? Is it usual Oh, I mean, there are several different versions of, of, of the file. It's not just some like linear independent sets. Yes, 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 yes. This is not independent sets. This is by, by the flats. Okay, I will give you the intuition in a second. Once uh, Ofa, once Ofa is happy. It grows on some subspace. Yes, yeah, yes. So another way to introduce the classical Steinitz conditions for algebraic dependent. I mean, this kind of. Yeah. So this is okay. Normally, people talk about independent sets. Right, but this is okay. So and then find an abstraction for them. Right, the exchange action. Now, I want, didn't want to because I wanted to 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 go to an object, an algebraic geometry object, more immediately. Um, and here, what I did is I, I basically look at the flats. So basically, you look at the sub the subsets of a vector configuration induced by subspaces. Okay. So here, the, con the, the con which condition is non-trivial? The fact that the union is everything, or that the intersections are um, the covering. Yeah. Covering. That's. I mean. I, 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 okay. It depends on what taste of non-trivial you have, but that would be the non-trivial one. Ah, okay. Because if the intersection is, uh, if they are not equal, then the intersection is strictly smaller than one. Yeah. Yeah, not to the other because they cannot contain each other. And then it must be L. Oh, and then it must be L. Uh, you took L. Okay, so that's clear. Yeah, so the covering property is the. Yeah, if you want it, that's a not, not, not trivial one. Yeah. And, uh, and from this, you get also the notion of the dimension of the. So the, the, what is generated by, by subset? It's just the, the like full dimension. Then you have to count. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. You're you're already stepping a little further. Yes. Again. No. Um, um, okay. This is the intuition for, for for subspaces. And now I want to define a fan associated to this. Um, um, I want to define a b fan B of M. Ah, and I should say, this is a matroid M um, associated to B, associated to M, to, um, to M. Um, and this will be a fan in R um, N minus 1, or, right, so it's, yeah, um, it's, yeah, sorry. Actually, I'm not. With my notation, it's just Rn. Sorry. I have n plus 1 elements. So I have um, the numbers Rn, right? So I have the numbers from 1 to n. Sorry. All right. Um, OK. So I want to define this fan. And so the, the way that I do it is I take Ei i in. The ground set a generating system for my matroid for for um, for R n such that the sum all right so these are these are n plus one vectors right because I started with a zero vector um, and I am um, I'm generating, so there's one linear relation, and I'm just demanding that this linear relation is that the sum is equal to zero. Okay. Um, all right. Um, then to every subset f for for f a subset of the ground set, I define e f um, to be um, well, I, I define EF to be the sum of the EI over RI and F. Um, 
And then finally, what I define is um, for, a for a flag of subsets, so uh, subsets ordered by inclusion, fi in flag in um, the ground set. Let me just uh, let me just exclude from this the empty set and the whole ground set. Um, I take um, I define e of fi to be the cone over E F one, so the cone over the elements, E F two, and so on. Okay, so this is just a cone. And now I can finally associate my fan. Associate uh, give my, I, I can I can finally associate the fan to the matroid. So B of M. This is um, the union. These are the cones. Cone. Um, ah, let me just. I introduced the notion. So EFI, um, where FI is a flag in L. Okay. And that's my object. Um, let me just give some examples, just two of them. Um, so for instance, um, if my matroid is, well, the numbers from 0 to 2, and then I have to give you a subset of the of the power set. Let me give you some. Okay, so I don't have to give you the empty set and the total set. So let me just give you um, one and just something boring: zero, one, and two. Then B of M. Well, this is just a one-dimensional fan in R two. Okay, that's it. Um, equivalently, I could, or maybe not equivalent. Three, three in yes, yeah. yes. And once again, tropical variety. Yes, that's, that's tropical currents now again. Um, tropical? And if you don't know tropical, oh, again, somehow this is a tropical hyperplane, but it, but it doesn't matter for us now. Okay, tropical hyperplanes. Tropical, yeah, it doesn't matter for us now. What you could talk is a fan in the usual sense, yes? Yes, uh, it's a fan in the usual sense, it's just a non complete one. Right? That's a fan here. Yeah, so the fan is the. Uh, uh, just the, the one, the, those ones, and not the. Not, not the space in between. Uh, yeah. So you've got. Uh, uh, 0, 1, 2, the maximal kind of. So here I, I declared the elements in L, but I left out the empty set and the total set. Okay? So two, you have two, two, what is two one? Or? So here's, this is E1, this is E2, and this is E0. What is it? Okay, maybe, maybe let me do another example. Maybe it's... No, no, but the, what is the matroid? That's a matroid on the ground side, zero, one, two. Yeah. And the elements in L are just Okay, the so non-trivial elements in L are just 0, 1, and 2. Just the one element subsets. Ah, oh, yeah, I did not read. I thought you wrote the, set, the you wrote, ah, 0. Ah, okay, you, one, one cannot see. So you should, if you should, if you should, empty set. Empty set. Yeah, empty set and total set, but they're obviously. Uh, yeah, okay, the single tone of the non-trivial. Yeah. Uh, all right. And so the only thing you can take is the single tone, and then you get those guys. Okay. And similarly, I could just take okay another matroid that always works, right? I could take um, L to be the, the the entire power set, right? 
I can, I can take L to be the entire power set, so every subset is a flat. Yeah, it goes one right. kind of to linearly independent. Yes, yeah, so, so think of this somehow. This here corresponds to just vectors in R2, general position vectors in R2. Three general position vectors. All right, that's what this corresponds to. All right, so the subsets induced by subspaces are this, 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 and then the entire thing. All right. Um, and um, now I could, I could also take three vectors in R3 in general position. And then what I get is essentially, um, well, I get uh, the same ground set, right? And then um, I get, well, the entire power set, right? And then the fan that I would associate to this would be, so I have, um, I have my vectors E0, E1, E2, I, okay, I did it the other way around there, two, one. And then I have, well, corresponding to the two element subsets, I have E1, two, this inclusion, I have E0, two, and the inclusions, and I have E0, one, and the inclusions. Right. So now this is a complete fan again. This, by the way, uh, somehow, either you want to call it the free matroid, or the lattice is just a Boolean lattice. Right. That's it. Is it the scale? If it's actual configuration of vectors, some kind of protocol, li uh, some limit, uh, toroidal limit or something? Hmm. Well, ah, you you mean you want to think of it as a tropical limit of, um, yes, uh, yes. I mean th now we can think of this. I mean these are these are hyperplanes, right? Well, this is a hyperplane. Yeah. Um, so it's a fine. Oh, it's good. Um, all right. Actually, somehow. Okay. So now I wanted to let me say a little bit, and somehow then we can talk after. Okay. Um, so. Um, let me say the main theorem here um, is the theorem of myself, Jimmy Ha, and Eric Katz. And um, let me write it in a very brief way. So I can look at BM, right? And I can look at A of BM, right? Again, I have a geometry given, right? This is a space of Conwise polynomials on this fan. Right, so this is again a space of convex polynomials, modulo the ideal right, generated by the global linear functions. All right, um, and this satisfies satisfies um, well one Poincaré duality. With the Sokol degree um, equal to the longest chain, longest chain in L, and now let me take the proper part, so which is L without uh, the empty set and the ground set. Um, and it satisfies hard left sheds. Um, and it satisfies our dreamer. Um, Is it really for more than some non-compact variety? Yes. Yes, we can construct a non-compact variety over over this over this fan, right? That's it. Here's a here's an interesting right somehow. Um, 
Here's an interesting factor, maybe. Okay, so maybe let me first say what L convex means here in this, uh, in this context. Uh, what, what convex means in this context. Okay? Um, so that for this here, we need um, a strictly convex form. But um, you notice that every L here, every matroid Im embeds into the, into the Boolean lattice, which is a complete fan, where we have a notion of convexity. Right? Just restrict those. Another way of saying it is that the coefficients of your L right, are from a, or from a strictly submodular function. That's another way of saying it. Okay? The coefficients of this L, right, write them down as a linear combination over the variables. They form a strictly submodular function. Or an, a sub a f an element in the interior of the submodular cone. The submodular cone. Submodular. Um, um, well, okay, so a modular function is, uh, okay, so notice that somehow here the, the, the variables are co the, the indexed by subsets, yeah. right? And now I can compute VA union B, somehow I can, I can compute a function on the union of, of, of two sets, I can yeah. compute a function on the intersection of two sets, yeah. and I can compare it to the function of, um, on, on the individual sets. Yeah. The function is submodular if um, what, you have, what you have on union plus um, intersection is less or equal to what you have, uh, the sum of uh, the individual parts. Yeah. And that's a yeah. And now have you, you have a cone of such functions to take an interior point. Now in algebraic geometry, so there is this uh, condition for ampleness in terms of line boundary in terms of the, the corresponding uh, combinatorial effect on complexity. Yeah. But this is sometimes stated for projective that is complete funds. And then if it's not a complete fund... Well, this is, uh, this is what I said first. Think of, think of your matroid as a, right? So think of your fan as a subfan of, of this complete fan here, right? Every, every L there is a subset of the power set. Take the complete fan. This gives you a notion of convexity. This gives you a notion of ampleness. Restrict it to the subfan coming from your given matroid. Oh, you, yeah, yes. you take things that come with restriction of. That's another way of doing it, yes. Yeah, but I remember that in some books it was not clear what is the ampleness. Yeah, that's right, right? So that's right. For instance, you can, if you want to look at the ample cone of M0N bar, then you can ask, well, okay, you can ask how it, how it, how it would look on, there is a matroid corresponding to it. This is just a graphic matroid of the complete graph. And then describing this ample cone is actually a trivial problem. It might be larger, you're right. Yeah. It might be larger than just a restriction. Right? It might be different, things might be, I mean, there might be more, um, there might be more ample functions than just those coming from the restriction here. Depending on how you define ample. Okay, maybe we should, I mean, okay, so maybe we should finish for today because I already, I mean, some of the remote people might have other, <laughs> might have other appointments. So, um, okay, so, okay, so it was, towards the end was a little rushed, I'm sorry. Um, I will try to repeat a little in the beginning of next time before I go to the kind of the, the, the really interesting stuff, which is the left sheds beyond positivity. Um, here we still have a notion of convexity, but uh, somehow, I will explain a little more about the context of this, about the ideas behind this theorem um, um, next time. Um, but maybe we should go to questions now and have a discussion. But, uh, Jan, do you have a question? Or? Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you, so, so did the ring you, de you define for, for this metric, is it a Chow ring or is it a something else? Yeah, it's a Chow ring, yeah. Okay, and uh, regarding the proof of this theorem you mentioned, uh, I mean, at least for the Hodge Riemann, is it also built on this on this inductive framework? Of yes, Malen? yes, that's exactly the same. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Thank you. What is the l last question? Whether well, how the proof works, but now I didn't get to it. Is my intuition right? It's a secondary polytops. Yes, yes. If you think about it, this is a, this is a normal fan over the promotahedron, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then I think there was recently some geometric inter interpretation of secondary polytops. Um, 
Well, I mean, there's, okay, so, uh, there are several things, but maybe we, yeah, well, let's, let's talk about them, yeah. Are there more remote questions? Okay, so then uh, let's unplug and let's have coffee.